Bob Kaufman, for me, was a meteorite, remains a meteorite. And um, I would come up and uh, do uh, Kaufman sightings in North Beach. And I saw Bobby one day, I'll call him Bobby, call him Uncle Robert, but uh, he was in front of me and he literally disappeared in front of my eyes. It's like the situation at Paz talks about Pessoa disappearing on the streets of Lisbon. And uh, Bob and I were approximate on several occasions. We never met directly because Philip Lamantia and I wandered the streets of North Beach looking for Bobby one afternoon. We couldn't find him. But hours later, we all congregated at Neely Tchaikovsky's house. And I saw the original manuscript of the ancient reign. The original and Bob was in the next room. So I wrote this essay. I'm just going to read a part of it. It's called The Footnotes Exploded. No footnotes, no, no, no academia with Bob. A voyager arriving in a darkened opal port, his verbal lens is honed by ingrown verbal preciseness, by an absence of buried mechanics. I think of the nascent Kaufman inwardly floating through explosive anonymities, never once singed by mundane repetition or sequel. His hearing is replete at the level of intuitive terminology at the root of its most seminal spinning. His language part aurora and lava flowing from a central vitrescence. It partakes of the spell, being hypnotic and genetic in demeanor. I mean, there is insight into life which sustains, sustains itself by means of intrinsic purity, by means of necessitous obscurity, which can never be subjected to rational decoding, to exoteric decipherment. Language, then, is not a given, not a sum to be captured and examined under a prevalent electron regalia. Verbal obstacle then leaps the accessible as sense, the quotidian as assumption. By his electrical presence, Kaufman's language escapes the analytical, the moment-by-moment -moment vacuum deemed climatic according to precedent assumed by the rules of rational exegesis and such exegesis denies and destroys the spontaneous in favor of pattern. Again, Kaufman, not a deleted fuchsia, but original respiration, a voice capable of traversing acres of fire, his mandibles torched by elemental tattoos, by various interior grails. And when compels such attention is his superior analogical power, aged by a fabulous turbulence, as if he had been cast into the frictive war waters at the center of a brimstone mountain. It is a poetic energy which continues to prevail, and by prevailing, I mean sustained hypnosis as experienced by the reader. I wanted to continue with one of my all-time mantras to my park my to my son Parker asleep in the next room on ochre walls in ice formed caves shaggy Neanderthals mark their place in time on germinal trees in equatorial stands embryonic giants carved beginnings. On Tasmanian flatlands, mud cloth, first men hacked rock still soft. On Melanesian mountain peaks, bark heads were reared in pride and beauty. On steamy Java's cooling lava, stooped humans raised stones to altar height. On newborn China's plain, mythless sons of Han acquired peak gods with teak faces. On holy India's sacred soil, future gods carved worship reflection. On Coptic Ethiopia's pimple rock pyramid, builders tore volcanoes from earth. 
on death-loving Egypt's godly sands, living sacrifices, carved naked power. On Samaria's cliffs, speechless artists gouge messages to men yet uncreated. On glorious Assyria's earthen dens, art priests chipped figures of awe in hidden dimensions. On splendid Peru's gold-stained body, filigree temples were torn from severed hands. On perfect Greece's body, sights marble stirred under hands of men. On degenerate Rome's trembling side, imitators sculpted lies into beauty. On slave Europe's prostrate form, chained souls shaped free men. On wild America's green torso, original men painted glacial languages. On cold articles, snowy surface, leathery men raised totems in frozen air. On this shore, you were all men before, forever, eternally free in all things. On this shore, we shall raise our monuments of stones, of wood, of mud, of color, of labor, of belief, of being, of life, of love, of self, of man expressed in self-determined compliance or willful revolt. Secure in this truth that no man is our master, nor can any ever be at any time and time to come. Tuning, tuning is poetry. You have to tune the being through alchemy. You know, everything Bob did was a tuning, and that's what a poet has to do. Every step, every breath you take is tuning. It's alchemical tuning, and it comes out in the language because poetry is like trees and wind and stars. It grows from the inside out, not the outside in. And so uh, one of my most trenchant influences has been Joanne Miro, the great painter. And uh, Kaufman has felt the same way. He, he wrote a poem called The Rue Miro. I think that's where Bob was born in the Rue Miro in New Orleans. Rue Miro. Miro, the flowers are up there on the wall where I last saw them. And the time before that, various with hot dots sticking out all over, prancing darkly in their wooden frame, their wall dancing like gypsies on the roof of a drum. Miro, there is a street with your name, name before you, after you, then and now it floats in drops and shadings, stranded in a fake Spain, farther than Montreux, way off a wet place of hot rains and yellowed long leaf plants. Named for a broken sun king, Louisiana rhymes with yesterday. Gone, past, moved on, ghostly, brown wishes. Miro, your name is a black ribbon in a stabbed landscape. Raved coal forms slanted against a stew of burning symbols and eyes. Blatantly honking ducks go unnoticed in expensive feathers. A faceless place of curving blood and fingering motions. Miro, empty turtles glide between a divide of Baroque hotels. Fleeing to Shelley nest deep inside a scooped out truth. A scope of thinning cries, a chorus of grinning oysters, heavy draperies from Toulon and rooms of drowning furniture dangling in the mind's eye. A walk through berserk air, 
Miro, I was born on your street 40,000 years ago in a year of Aprils and screamed a flock of dazed geese scattered. Miro, on that street, I heard a fever and saw a white moon by the Galvez greens broken into millions of transparencies. And after Bob, you know, I, how can I do anything but write? So this is the blood penguin of my own. I am, a carn I am the carnivore, the hound at night walker, searching for my wings scattered under glass. They claim I should return to monomial transfixing to exhibit A and no further. To some, I am six foot and lizard. To others, I am considered a mange lamb returned from the tropics. I am never given due as to some a proportion. I am seen as the source of something leprous, as no longer the motive of who I was thought I was shaped to be. I who live as mistake late damage as part of pointless verbal ejecta. There are no nouns to ensnare me, to fish up my blood so as to summon consensus. I am never that condition within the fire of conjoinment. I am never to be the human boy genius, the archivist, the bartered child contending with study. I am none of the above, none of the aforesaid compendiums. I am the animus, the vertical lion tundra, the diamond bird who burrows under snow. Because of my leaning, I know the stark Egyptian Soma, much as would a blinded cemetery scribe. And because I understand one's basic neural unravelment, I am seen as piacular, as specter, as both standing and freezing, being of some other form from some other planet. As clinical moray addendum, this contains in itself black and scrawl marks from Moravia, from Squanda Quanda, from the Sunda Islands, from quaking fogs from Santiago. They say I suffer from powerful deafening by resistance, my eyes wild and inferocious with lapses, the attention span blunted, the astrological paralysis shifted. So they say the unknown is the trigonomic is the transcendent nucleus, the born equational spell, according to the flaws of universal summoning. I am ancient pantomime who cannot grasp, who cannot transgress his inherited Landino. As to Mayan glyphs and squares, I am plummeted. I am simply without the means to conduct my own prism. To make, to take on the culpable mean at circumstantial limit. I exist through negated practical limit, through parallel sub-causes, without knowing the desire to seek the enzymes of living. I am without and without and without. I who create doubt and the genetics of perpetual conflict. I could be strange as a human half rod who poses himself as Hilario Pazuelos. And what is claimed against me is not unreasoned, is not the treatise of post fanatics. Instead, it is a curious treatise on, on circumstantial exhibit. It says my values are possessed by distance like someone humbled or plagued by a treaty. My dispossessed senses described by these methods under the forms of the treasonous. It tells me I am lifeless blood equipment, that my genes are not useful, that my mind is simply stricken or exposed. Yet, such a chronicle loses spores in the glaciers, 
It says, I am of Africa and the sea coast of Ghana and the Seychelles of insular breakage near the Azores. Yet it states my non-placement, my cavern, my debilitating refuge. Not even a dwelling beneath the stars as etheric camp base on Saturn. Such is the ether climb. The sub-revelation is dielectrical cartography, conjoining with the ocelots swimming across the prisms of Mauritius. or simple flat land in Manchuria. These are seen as soils no known warrior can claim because I readily announce my resistance, my tone as carnivorous, psychic, sparring, wandering beyond pervasive death concussives, claimed by genetic dislogistics, by anarchic ruin, by Jurassic sibling cirrhosis, I cannot describe by cursory enclosure, external motivation, or any rotary or back flowing water attainment. It is described as simulacra, as ghost data, as hibernation through pillage, non specific, post necrotic partaking in part as jungle and longevity. Of course, of course the cells blaze. Infinity evolves. The monsoons project through containment. Yet nothing resolves. Nothing forbears and is clement. I exist as steep electrical ice, asking of myself spells of pointless dominating fuels. Within this agnostic current, I describe myself as one who's hellish, who's buried his weight with a double insistence, who seems to sleep in a brazen cylinder of peril. Then after a pause in listening, calling myself the blood penguin embraced by squalls, by an oily and misshapen blinding. <laughs> <laughs>